Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation on economic growth and mitigation scenarios, which is in my view a blind spot in climate science. So this uh, presentation um, is based on a paper on, that I published under the same name in 2018 for the Heinrich Böll Foundation and it can be found on the internet in English and in German if you want to read up on th some of the things. First up, um, where I come from, or who I work for, which is the Konzeptwerk Neue Ökonomie, or Laboratory for New Economic Ideas. And we are an NGO in Leipzig, and we basically try to live the change that we want to see in society. That means we work what we call a short full time, which is 20 to 30 hours a week. We make decisions by consensus, and we have a sal salary that is tailored to people's needs. If there's more questions about this, feel free to contact me. All right, let's get right to the problem. And the whole problem can be uh, summarized in this one ci ci citation from the IPCC report, um, the fifth assessment report from 2014, where it says that mitigation scenarios reaching about 450 ppm, which is um, what you need to stay within two degrees, um, they usually um, involve temporary overshoot of atmospheric concentrations. So basically what they're saying is that if we want to, that the scenarios that they're calculating right now, in order to stay below two degrees, they have to go beyond two degrees, at least when it comes to the CO2 emissions. Um, and then we go back below uh, further on in the time to 2100. And that is a problem in my, in my view because there, the, as you might know, the climate system is very complex and there are tipping points, which are basically systems that are reinforcing. For example, if the glaciers melt away, then the ground below it is much darker and it uh, absorbs heat much, absorbs sunlight much better than glaciers would do, which reflect a lot of sunlight. And there are all kinds of reinforcing systems that some, of, some we know about, some we don't know about. So it is not clear that if once we um, increase temperatures by more than two degrees, if it will be easy or even possible to go uh, below two degrees again in the temperature change. And um, the second sentence is that depending on the level of the overshoot, the scenarios typically rely on the availability of widespread deployment of BECCS and afforestation. BECCS stands for bio energy and carbon capture and storage. So the idea is that you um, grow a lot of biofuel, you burn it to produce um, electricity or heat. And the exhaust from that, the, the emissions, you, um, you take the CO2 from these emission streams and you put them somewhere safe, underground or wherever. And hopefully they will, they will stay there until all time and not go into the atmosphere again. And this is a technology that has not been um, tried on the on the scale that would be needed and there's also a lot of risks involved with it first of all you have to grow a lot of biomass which can be problematic from a number of social and ec ecological point, points of view and then we don't know uh, how, how where, to, where to put these emissions where, where we are sure that they would stay um, below and not come into the atmosphere again and and thirdly you need a lot of electricity or energy to take the get the CO2 from the emissions. So this, it's a very wasteful method, I'd say. Right, so this is, these are the two problems that these scenarios, um, they have this overshooting and they usually foresee this widespread deployment of technologies that we don't yet have and that are problematic. So why does the IPC draw these conclusions? And in my opinion, it does draw draw these conclusions because it relies on scenarios that foresee everlasting economic growth, which is a major driving force for emissions, if not the driving force for emissions. All right, so, so why is that? Like, why, why is there no degrowth discussions in the IPCC reports or in the scientific community? Um, and to answer that, you basically, I try to look at this this way. There are two ways that degrowth perspective could come into the discussion. One is that um, you have assumptions that go into the model. These models, they usually calculate emissions 
and uh, so the climate system from now to 2100. And for that to work, you have to make a lot of assumptions on the development of humanity as a whole up to that time. Um, and these assumptions are, for example, economic growth, population growth, but also more intangible things like uh, will there be will it be more a world of conflict or cooperation between nation states and will there be cultural change whatever the consumption patterns that patterns that we have in different parts of the world all these things have they have to they have people the scientists have to come up with some kinds of kind of assumptions and of course they could just have a, a scenario where they say okay economic growth does not uh, economic the gdp does not grow anymore at least not in the countries of the global north this is the one way the other way is that the, mo the models itself could produce results that would allow us to talk more about less production and consumption what the models pr um, pr um, present at the end in these scenarios is that is a way a path forward to meet certain um, emission targets and uh, they do this by uh, by saying we need a certain number of mitigation measures, building more renewables, building more nuclear power plants, increasing efficiency of our appliances and of buildings. Uh, and they could also say sufficiency. They got to say we need 10% less car traffic in the global north or something like that, but they don't. So this is the second point. And we will look at both sides, starting with the assumptions. Um, and there we have to look at the, at the process in, for the IPCC. Basically, it's a two-part two, two pro process. The first one is to identify possible development pathways, and the second one is to quantify these things because you cannot put pros into the model. You have to put all these ideas about the future into hard numbers. But first off, uh, let's talk about these pathways. Um, for the fifth assessment report, there was a, a, a big... Um, exercise to come up with so-called shared socioeconomic pathways. It was a complex process, several iterations, a large number of scientists were involved, modeling experts as well as future researchers and practitioners from the global north and the global south. And they basically came up with five scenarios, which are here, and that they are the, the, they are the five SSPs, the socioeconomic pathways. And the most important for us is sustainability, because it goes uh, at, it goes in the direction that we want to see the most. And there it actually says in the text that uh, for high income countries, there might be a shift away from economic growth towards human well-being, which of course is great. It's awesome to have these statements in the report. But then these, th these um, assumptions have to be put into numbers. And for GDP, this works by uh, employing models, models on economic um, development. And this was done by three different teams and they employ neoclassical growth models because these are the most mainstream models in uh, economics that, are be, that, that people use. And they came up with um, GDP numbers for the whole world, but also for different regions. And um, these are the, the, this is the GDP per capita in $2,005 from 2000 to 2100 in the five SSPs, in this, the, the shared pathways. Uh, and as you can see, even our um, our favorite pathway, sustainability, SSP1, SSP we have a large increase in uh, GDP. It's actually, uh, these growth rates actually differ between 1% and 2.5% per year, which results in at least a doubling of economic activity in the next 80 years. So a doubling means twice as much production, twice as much consumption uh, on a global level. And even for the global north, they still foresee positive growth rates from now until 2100. And if it's if you if you take the highest highest um, border, go to the set, go to 2.5 percent. That's actually a sevenfold increase in economic activities in 80 years. So seven times as much economic production uh, and activity, which I find hard to uh, imagine even. All right, so what we see is that um, we don't get this uh, growth critic perspective by looking at the assumptions and introducing assumptions that are very critical of economic growth, or at least have one scenario where economic growth um, or GDP goes down. Now, 
looking at the other part, the mitigation measures. Um, and to understand how the model comes up with uh, solutions for which mitigation measures are employed in this scenario, we have to look at the model in more detail. The models that are employed for the, for the studies that the IPCC sites are so-called IAMs or integrated assessment models. And uh, to put it very, uh, very easy terms, they mostly um, consist of two parts. They have a lot of data on mitigation measures. Mitigation measures are, as I already said, uh, building more renewables, uh, building more efficient gas power plants, shifting away from coal or uh, more efficient appliances, all these things. And they have these measures and they have some figures on how much they cost and what their mitigation potential is um, and when they will be available and other all that kind of other data. Some, some things might be available right, in, right now, sometimes some things might take a few years to build or some technologies might not be available um, in, might not be available now, but might be available in 10 years. And looking at these, uh, this portfolio of mitigation measures, I took this um, global greenhouse gas abatement cost curve, um, as it's called by McKinsey. And this is actually, this is kind of what you can imagine this, the models also have in, in themselves as data. So this is a, um, a curve and um, on the y-axis we have the abatement cost or the mitigation costs in euros per ton of CO2 equivalent. And on the x and on the x-axis we have the abatement potential. So how much CO2 can be saved or mitigated by the, um, by the mitigation measure. And on the very left we have measures that actually do, do not cost anything but make money because usually uh, you save um, energy costs and there's a lot of uh, efficiency measures are here, um, like uh, residential electronics or uh, insulation ret retrofit of buildings and all kinds of things that usually save, um, save fossil fuels and uh, save emissions. And then on the right side, uh, on the middle, you have things that cost almost nothing or just a little bit. Uh, like uh, reduce slash and burn agriculture conversion, reduce pasture land conversion, some agriculture measures. And on the, on the right, you have things that get more and more expensive. And then on the very right, you have things like uh, CCS retrofitting power plants, which means um, you take a gas, gas power plant or a coal power plant that has already been built and you put this carbon capture and storage technology on top of it, which makes it very expensive to do this retrofitting. And um, now, if, uh, if um, you have a scenario and you say, and in the scenario, um, the model knows that it has to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by, let's say, 20 gigatons, then it would go from the very left and introduce all these measures and assume that all these measures are, em are um, employed until it comes to 20. And it's, this is where it would stop. And it would say, all the measures uh, right to this 20, we don't need to employ them. and we we start with the ones left because they're the cheapest. So this is how the model works. Of course, the, the IAMs usually don't have like one curve like this, but they have much more uh, dynamic things. They, they uh, have, these curves are um, calculated for every year, for example. And they also um, incorporate investment costs, um, running costs and stuff like that. All right, and these um, mitigation measures, what is, um, I'd say, widely known more or less is that the measure, the, these models are very good with when it comes to supply side measures. Um, the, these mitigation measures are very much very well implemented in the models. On the effic efficiency side, it's already much uh, much worse because um, efficiency measures are usually um, they happen on a much smaller scale. For example, if you if you change the the windows in your house, that's an that's an efficiency measure, and in contrast to that, if you build a new wind power plant, that's so much big, such a bigger, much more bigger thing, and it's much more easier, much easier to get costs for that and cost estimates. So, usually the demand side measures are already um, not as well integrated in the models, so that efficiency um, demand side measures. And then when it comes to suffi sufficiency, these measures are not e not really in the model. Like, there's no uh, driving less or um, what else? 
having less air traffic or having less production of steel or something like that in these models. And so this is a problem because the, the measures are not really in the, in, the, um, in the models because the models, they, but if you, if you look at this curve again, it's only technical um, mitigation measures. There's no room for societal mitigation measures like different um, organize, organizing of society that may actually might be more energy uh, saving. All right, but even if, uh, if, even if these mitigation measures would be in these models, I would still be skeptical that they would be used by the model, that the model would choose to um, actually use these, these measures. And to talk about this, we have to look at the algorithm. And the algorithm decides which measures are taken, which mitigation measures are taken and when in the time from 2020 to 2100 in the models. And to decide this, um, it's not that you put it in, like you, the modeler, you, you don't decide, okay, in 2050, we want to have uh, wind power increased by X giga gigawatts or whatever, but the model decides this in itself. And to, to, in order to do that, it, use, it needs to optimize something. And what it optimizes is the welfare function or sometimes also called the utility function. And this is a very um, simple representation of a utility function. And as you can see, the utility um, depends on the consumption per person times the number of person. So, so what it, the model tries to do is, is maximize the consumption per person and the number of persons. And it has this little lo logarithm function, which is actually quite good because that means that people who already consume a lot, if they increase their consumption, it's not as, it doesn't increase overall utility as much as if a person with a very low consumption increases their consumption. All right, but as you can already see, this is not really a welfare function because welfare is not only consumption, I'd say. And um, this leads to, this leads to the, uh, to the point that measures leading to less production and consumption, for example, less traffic, less living space per capita, shorter working days, less advertisement, they really do not stand a chance against technical measures because these measures, they actually try to, to, to reduce consumption per person. They directly try to um, reduce that which the model tries to maximize. And uh, of course, what the models don't include is, are the positive effects of growth inhibiting measures such as more free time, less noise, healthy environment, and so on and so forth. And it also overlooks all the dangers of negative emission technologies and even nuclear power plants, all the things that are uh, difficult to quantify or that we don't know about yet. So uh, what I would say actually is that the results from these models is that they come up with solutions which are not the best optimal, optimal societal solution, but they present the cheapest solution assuming a very limited set, set, set of um, measures and negate, negating the, the possibility of societal change. All right, so we don't get a, a close critical perspective from the assumption side. We also don't get a discussion on sufficiency measures from the, um, from the results side of these models. And in the end, what we, what we end up is with is that we talk about how much um, carbon capture technologies we need at one point or uh, how much nuclear we need instead of talking about uh, how do we want the world to be in 2100 and how do we want to live, how much consumption do we want to have and what kind of environment destruction are we, are we, are we um, okay to sacrifice for the Earth. All right, so my conclusions are, and this is the first point is actually a conviction, not a conclusion, um, that this continuous economic growth is neither possible on a limited planet nor socially desirable. And constructing alternatives is not utopian, but radically realistic. And, and now the conclusions start. The, the shared socioeconomic pathways and assumptions with regard to socioeconomic drivers, they do not present such an alternative. The IIMs, uh, further obstruct this across critical perspective because they purely focus on technical mitigation measures and they use a utility function that is very limiting. And my recommendations from this study were that um, to the scientific community were to 
establish research projects that envisage pathways beyond growth, include voices outside of the economic mainstream for that, expand the models to include degrowth measures and better reflect the complexity of human needs, which are of course more than just material consumption. And failing this, I'd suggest that they uh, should be much more careful when interpret, inter, interpret, interpreting their results. Okay, and of course, policymakers and civil society, they, they should um, ask for these changes and support them through funding and public relations work. All right, this is the, the end of my presentation, but I always try to have some kind of picture to, to make it easier to understand or to, to have something that you keep in mind. And I, basically, I think this is our position when it comes to climate change. We, we are on, on, on this train and that's like the society train or the economy train and we're heading towards a cliff and the cliff would be climate change, disaster to climate change. And we just assume that by the time we reach the cliff, there will be this new bridge, which is uh, made of these negative emission technologies. So we just hope, we gamble that this will be available and it will work and it will be okay to, to use it, to implement it. And I think what we don't see is that we can just stop the train. That would be one alternative. Or we could just take a, a whole different path and not go to the cliff, but somewhere else. All right, thank you for, for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, um, ask them right now or send me an email uh, afterwards.